greatly encouraged. We're going to be continuing with the life of David from 2 Samuel chapter 22, and I am going to pray, and then we're going to get going. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to call upon you, the one who is worthy to be praised. I ask God that you would use me as an instrument for your glory, as an instrument for your encouragement that you would meet all of us in the place we are at today. Lord, I, I especially want to lift up anybody that's in here today that's discouraged, that's distressed, depressed, whatever it may be, hurting, going through a difficult time. Lord, I pray for those who even doubt their faith or doubt that you are real. Lord, I ask that today you would use our time together and that you would use me as a vessel for your purposes to bring glory to you and May it be you who ministers to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we come to this place today in chapter 22 of 2 Samuel, we are rapidly approaching the end of David's life. David, by this time, he's an old man. We only have a few more Sundays with David before we're going to see him go to heaven. But that's just a few more Sundays out. David's rapidly approaching the end of his life, and, and, and also the end of his reign as being king of Israel for 40 years. Chapter 22 of 2 Samuel is almost identical to Psalm 18. So you see Psalm 18 up there on the screen also. You can actually read along from Psalm 18 if you want, but to connect some of the exactness of what we're going to be talking about, I'll be reading from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22. Now here's the deal with with the chapter we're at today and Psalm 18. Psalm 18 was written when David was a younger king, a much younger man. Chapter 22 is filled in here when David is a much older man. Now, there are some scholars who say that chapter 22 of 2 Samuel is a mistake because it is in the Bible twice, once in Psalm 18, once here in chapter 22, and they say it's a mistake. This is what I say. I say God doesn't make mistakes. If God can make the universe, the stars, the, the sun, the moon, I'm pretty confident that it's not hard for him to figure out chapters and verses and that kind of thing and not sit up there and go, oh, how did I get that in there twice? I don't think he did that. I believe it's quite simply this, that God has it in here twice because he knows that you and I need to see this twice. He doesn't want us to miss it. This chapter is a chapter that gives great hope to men when they are in despair, it gives strength to us when we are weak. It provides the extra boost of faith when we need it most. It says, God on high in the hearts of men. It speaks of the Messiah to come who would save men. It is encouraging, it's uplifting, it's redeeming, it's welcoming, it's refining, it's directing, it's delivering, it's saving. When we, we read in this chapter that God is our rock, he's our fortress, our deliverer, our strength, our stronghold, our refuge, our savior. He is the one who is worthy to be praised and he saves us from all of, his, all of our enemies. And I look at this chapter and I think, praise God. I am convinced that today is going to be one of the most uplifting and encouraging places you can go to in the Bible. But here's the deal. Chapter 22 of 2 Samuel is long. Psalm 18 is long, so I am not going to, to, to cover every single detail, all right? But this is what I'm going to encourage you to do. I'm going to encourage you, after today, to go home and make chapter 22 and or Psalm 18 part of your meditation every day this week, because I believe that God wants to do great and mighty things in you and through you, and the same thing with me. But we have a lot of verses to cover. As I mentioned, we're not going to go into every detail, but I believe we're going to get what we need for this morning. So you ready? Okay, chapter 22 begins, verse 1. David is now an old man. An old man, it says here. Then David, he spoke to the Lord the words of this song. On the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of Saul, uh, from the hand of all his enemies, excuse me, and from the hand of Saul, and David said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. What's going on here? Well, first off, David is recognizing the one, the Lord, the one who is the one that I trust. Notice opening words here. The words of David that he spoke of this song. This is exactly how Psalm 18 reads also. 
Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song. Remember, the Psalms are what? Songs. This, is, this, this isn't hard. The Psalms are songs. And David here in chapter 22, he is now an old man. When he wrote Psalm 18, he was a young man. Now he's an old man and he is repeating the same thing. The words of that song that he wrote when he was much younger. When was this song originally written? Well, it's pretty easy for us to figure out because this tells us. David spoke this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. When did that happen? A little bit of history for us. Check it out. Turn to the left in your Bibles, not too far, just back to chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and check this out. We can figure out exactly when David wrote Psalm 18 or reflected upon Psalm 18 here for chapter 22 of 2 Samuel. Note here in chapter 7, we read verse 1. It came to pass when King David was dwelling in his house that the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. Remember that? That's what we just read in chapter 22, verse 1, right? David spoke the words of the psalm when he had rest from all of his enemies, when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and the hand of Saul, verse 2. That the king, he said to Nathan the prophet, so David says to Nathan the prophet, while he's got rest from his enemies, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. If you were with us when we covered that passage, you remember how the whole thing worked. Saul was now dead, his enemy who pursued him, right? Ishbosheth, the other king, was now dead. David had conquered Jerusalem. He, he eliminated the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. David was conquering all of his enemies. He had conquered the Philistines. We come to chapter 7, and David is going, wow, now I'm at rest. God has given me great victories. I want to build a house for God. I want to build a temple for God to put the ark there. This psalm, or chapter 22, was written originally when David was a younger king, after his days of running from Saul as a fugitive, after Saul was dead, after Ishbosheth, the other king was dead, after he defeated all of the warring people around him. But it was also written before his sin with Bathsheba. Keep that in mind because it's going to become very relevant in just a few minutes. Now, with that in mind, now please turn back to chapter 22 and look at this again. Verse 1, David spoke these words to the Lord when David was delivered from the hand of Saul. Now, now think of this. Let's go back in history a little bit more, history of David. When David was, say, a teenager... He went out and he defeated the giant Goliath. Remember that? Goliath the Philistine. David's dad mocked him. David's brothers mocked him. Remember that? you got to be kidding me. David can't do anything. Look at this scrawny little kid. You're going to take all of my, my, my awesome sons and you're going to take scrawny little David to go, oh, this is, this is just humorous. Saul saw David and put his armor around him. Saul was a giant of a man. David was just this kid. It didn't fit. And then David, he said to his brothers, and he said to Israel, and he said to Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and answering their doubts and their mocking, he said, when I was taking care of my father's flocks, when I was taking care of the sheep, the Lord gave me victory over the lion and the bear. When a lamb was in the lion or the bear's mouth, I killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. The paw of the lion, the paw of the bear. Now check this out. When David says, the Lord is the one who has delivered me from the hand of Saul, this is exactly the word he uses for hand, cough, which we get our English word 
paw. David is remembering, guess what? God delivered me from the paw of the lion. He delivered me from the paw of the bear. He's delivered me from the paw of all of my enemies. He has delivered me from the paw of, of Saul who acted like a wild animal and wanted to try and kill me. David has the right perspective. You and I get the right perspective. Listen, God is the one who delivers us from the hand, from the paw, from the claws of all our enemies who might want to bring us down. And this is what David is remembering. God is my helper. He is the one who is strong. May we be like David. Here in chapter 2, David is remembering the words of this psalm that he wrote when he was younger, reflecting back on his victories that the Lord has given him. By this time he is old, by the time you get to chapter 22. He has sinned with Bathsheba, he has committed bloodshed, he has sinned against God, had been involved in some unscrupulous things, but still he knows, God, you save me, God, you keep me in spite of me. There are people that want to tear me apart like a lion or a bear, but you deliver me from their hand. Listen, there are people out there that might want to do that to you. You have confidence, you have faith, you press forward and be encouraged today. Look at what David writes here. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. He's my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I trust. My shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge, my savior. You are the one who saves me from violence. I love that. My rock, my fortress, my deliverer. So number one, it's the one who I trust, David says. Number two, it's the one who is worthy. Look at this. This is so cool. Verse four. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Sounds like a song we just sang, doesn't it? When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Shul, they surrounded me. The snares of death, they confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken. Because God was angry, smoke went up from his nostrils, devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon the cherubim and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of the many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Wow! That is amazing! This is it. This, you, you, David is looking back. This is what God has done for me in my life. Someone said, I think it was David Guzik who said, faith does not completely depend on knowledge, but the right knowledge of God gives great strength to faith. This is where David is. He's got the right mind. He's not looking at the troubles. He's looking at the greatness of God. He's got the right knowledge of God. And because of that, he has great faith. Here's the thing of it. There are many people here today that need to have their strength, their faith strengthened. You've got to have it, and you know it. You've come in here with doubts. You've come in here with discouragements. You've come in distressed, depressed. This is the mind that we need to have. This is the mind that David has right here. Wait a minute. I remember God. He's not looking at the circumstances, right? He's looking at the greatness of God. God delivered David from Goliath. God delivered David from Saul. God delivered David from backsliding. God delivered David from Israel's enemies. God delivered David from Absalom. God delivered David from his own sinful passions. In his old age, he can look back with great gratitude and sing this song again and and say, Lord, you're worthy to be praised. You have saved us from all of our enemies. If you look back at verse 2, David said this. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. 
if you look over at Psalm 18, it's said a little bit differently. This is so crazy and so cool. In Psalm 18, verse 1, before David says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, in Psalm 18, before he says those words, this is what David says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Now, this is so fascinating. Why is it? Now, David wrote Psalm 18 when he was younger, right? He had great victories. Remember what I said? He had not yet sinned with Bathsheba when he wrote Psalm 18. As an old man, chapter 22, David is now looking back over his life, and he's recognizing. I'm convinced he's recognizing, you know what? When I was younger, before my Bathsheba days, I was able to say, I love you, Lord, but now I'm not so sure because I know the reality of what I've done. Remember Peter in the New Testament? Oh, Lord, I love you more than anybody else. Remember that from the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke? Oh, Lord, I love you more than anybody Lord, there's nobody that loves you as much as I love you. Lord, all, even though all of the other apostles, looking at all the other 11, right? Even though they will deny you, right? Not me. I'm not going to deny you. Remember what happened? Peter denied the Lord three times. Jesus finds him by the shore of Galilee. Do you love me, Peter? Not so sure, was he? You know what the big difference was between Peter and Judas? Peter repented, Judas did not. But Peter was able to say before, he was able to boast about his love for the Lord. Oh, I love you, Lord, until he had his great failure. Suddenly he's not able to boast about it. I, I think we can be that way too, can't we? You talk to someone who's a brand new believer in the Lord. They're a believer for a week. They're a believer for six months. They might be a believer for a year or something like that. And they're thinking, woo-hoo, I love the Lord, right? Right? And then they can't figure out why someone that's been a Christian for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years is a little bit more steady as she goes. They're thinking, what is the matter with all of you other people? Why can't you love the Lord as much as I do? Look at how on fire I am. That, 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 right? And then they go through their crash and burn. And then they find out, hey, they're just like everybody else. But it's that correction. I'm convinced that David went through that correction. Interesting, in Psalm 18 where David said, I love you, he doesn't use a typical word for love. He uses this Hebrew word, rakam, which means to yearn over. It literally means this, or suggests this, that David wanted to hug God. But I'm guessing that now that David is an older man, he's saying, that's not so much about me hugging you. It's like, I need a hug from you because I've messed up. In verse 5, David wrote, the waves of death, they, they, they surrounded me. Floods and sorrows and snares, they've confronted me. Joseph Bryant Rotherham in, in, in the Rotherham Emphasized Bible renders verse 5 as the breakers of death have encompassed me. It is the thought of breakers in the, air, in the sea, surging like the rise of waters in a hurricane. The sea of death is rolling and tormenting with floods and sorrows and snares. And then in verse 7, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. Look at this. He heard my voice and my cry entered his ears. Such was the pattern of David's life. He had his enemies. He had committed his sins, but he knew that the Lord kept him and he knew that the Lord heard him. David also is the one who wrote Psalm 31 and Psalm 86. In both of those psalms, you know what David wrote? He wrote these words. Bow down your ear to me, O Lord, for I am poor and needy. Bow down your ear to me, O Lord. Be my fortress. Be my rock. Oh, bow down your ear to me. You know what the picture is of that? The picture is this of a little boy who's gravely ill. And he's in bed in his room, and he cannot get up. He's gravely ill. Into the room comes daddy. And the little boy looks up at his daddy, Papa, daddy, bow down your ear to me. I need a hug from you. Daddy, bow down your ear to me. Daddy, I don't feel good. Daddy, help me. This is the idea that David is conveying here. Uh, in my distress, I called upon you. It was that simple for, the, for, for David. You heard me. Do you understand, Christian, that God hears you? 
See, we understand it in, in thought, right? We got it in thought. We've read it in his word. But when we go through the trials, understand this, Christian. God is for you. He's not against you. Bow down your ear. Oh, God, and he hears us. And we go through our pain, and we go through our heartache, and we go through our trials. And David's able to reflect on all of this. Verse 8, the earth shook and trembled. Verse 10, God bowed the heavens and he came down. In, in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1, Isaiah writes, tear open the heavens and come down. God did tear open the heavens and God did come down in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. People have raised their fist at God and said, why don't you come down from heaven and visit us? He did. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he came down from heaven, became a babe in a manger, and died upon a cross so that anyone who would believe in him would be forgiven of their sins. And God meets man in his sins and in his sorrow and in his sadness as he comes down from heaven. Verse 14, the Lord thundered and uttered his voice. When I hear thunder... I like the sound of thunder. Anybody else like it? My, you know, dogs don't typically like it too much, but hey, they're dogs, right? I like that thunder. I, I, that, that's God. I can imagine the, the voice of God or when the earthquakes. I mean, earthquakes can be a little bit unhinging. But at the same time, I know it's the God of heaven who's doing the shaking. That's what David is saying. Verse 17 and 18, he took me and drew me out of many waters and delivered me from those who hate me. He picked me up from the flood of hatred that kept flowing my way. These people hate me. I read, they, you should see what they wrote on Facebook about me. Right? <laughs> Last night I had the most discouraging time. Reading, I, I made the mistake of reading things on websites. It is amazing what people will say behind a computer and fired off. But unbelievable. And David has said, I'm in, I, I've got this flood of hatred around me. Drew, drew, you are the one who drew me out of the, the flood of hatred. Verse 20, he delivered me because he delighted in me. David knew that God's help had nothing to do with David. It is the Lord and the Lord alone. He does not know why God delighted to do this for him but that this is what God does for his children. He does it for him. He does it for you. He does it for me. He saves me and delivers me from all of my fears and all of my enemies. The Lord is my light and my salvation, he wrote elsewhere. Whom shall I be afraid? Therefore, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from all of my enemies. I'm going to read this to you from Romans chapter 8, you can turn there if you want, verse 31, but we're going to be back in 2 Samuel in just a minute. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, listen to these words or read along with me if you want. Paul the Apostle is writing, this sounds so much like David in the New Testament. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Isn't that what David is saying? Indeed it is. Look what else. He continues. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? By the way, it's the enemy of your soul that condemns. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed. All day long we are counted as sheep to the slaughter. And then Paul he concludes this section with these words, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what David is conveying. In the Old Testament, for us who are living 3,000 years later, and Paul confirmed in the book of Romans. Number three, David is reflecting on the one who is faithful 
back in chapter 22, verse 21. David says, oh, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Listen to his words here. Very interesting. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the devious, you show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. When you read verses 21 through 25, it sounds like David is boasting about how awesome he is, doesn't it? Look at how faithful I am. Look at how awesome I am. Woohoo! Look at my spiritual muscles. I mean, this is what it sounds like it, doesn't it? David, know this. This is so cool. David's not boasting about his own faithfulness. Check out how David is boasting about the faithfulness of the Lord. Note, he says, Lord, you rewarded me according to what? My righteousness. To the cleanness of my hands, I have kept the ways of the Lord. What? David? I know David. You know David, right? I did not depart from your statutes. Really, David? I am blameless. Really? Now, we've been here a lot of Sundays with David. How's he able to say that? Note in verse 24, he says, I was blameless before God. Why could David say this? Because of what God had done for David. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he sinned big, didn't he? Do you recall what happened when David, the, when, uh, David was confronted by Nathan the prophet? Nathan the prophet goes, David, he's, he's a sin with Bathsheba, he's committed murder. The sins are horrible, they're, they're, they're too numerous to mention. Nathan the prophet confronts David. He says, David, man, you sinned. David confessed his sin, right? Remember that? And then Nathan, Nathan said this, David, the sword will not depart from your own house. In fact, it didn't. Four of David's sons died tragically. In fact, after David sinned with Bathsheba, his life was never the same. Everything we have read since then has been nothing but persecution and trial and heartache for the rest of David's life. So Nathan the prophet, he said this, David, the sword shall not depart from your house. And then he said this, however, David, the Lord has put away your sin. In this sense, David is blameless before God. In the same sense of you and me. We look backward to Christ Jesus, don't we? We look backward to what he's done on the cross, right? David is looking forward to the Messiah, the Redeemer, who is to come for him. We are looking back at the Messiah, the Redeemer, who has come for us. There's not a person in here who can say, you know what, I was blameless, I was righteous, I was faithful, I've kept your word in every single detail. I've never failed, I've never done this, I've never done that. Lord, I, I, I am awesome, awesome, awesome. You can't say that. How is it that David was able to say this? David looked forward to God the Messiah who would come and wash him clean of all of his sins. The same David who wrote this in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions for, from us. As a father pities his own children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. So David is able to say in verse 24, I was blameless before him Verse 25, according to my cleanness, verse 25 says, in his eyes. I praise God that I'm forgiven. Because <laughs> quite frankly, I need it. And I want it. I praise God that it's the forgiveness in his eyes because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Has he cleansed you? Praise him for the forgiveness. Amen. Then David says in verse 26, with the merciful you show yourself merciful. It's payback, right? 
you give mercy to somebody else, God says, I'll give you mercy. In the Old Testament book of Proverbs, you minister to those who are poor, you'll be taken care of when you're older and you're poor. That's pretty good to know, isn't it? It's a payback thing. Listen, this isn't John Lennon karma thing, right? This is a Bible thing. You reap what you sow. You, you, you sow to the, the, the flesh, you reap of the flesh. You sow to the spirit, you reap of the spirit, right? So you understand, listen, listen, you and I, we forget this principle. Here's the thing. When we look at something like this, you show yourself merciful, God will show himself merciful to you. What we forget in Christians, what we forget in church, we forget to take the things that we learn in the Bible and take them beyond Sunday morning. Listen, does anybody in here know anyone that needs a, a shot of mercy? We do. Some of you are thinking, I need it. Well, then you show yourself merciful to somebody else. God says, I'll show you mercy. Right? Th th this is it. You know somebody that needs a visit? You know somebody, man, maybe they just want, they're just dying for someone, emotionally dying, for someone to come along and say, you know, let me take you out to lunch today. Let me just read, listen, let's go. I want to take, they, they need that. They just want to know that somebody cares. If this is what the Lord is saying, listen, you do that, I will show you that I care. You show my love, I will show you love back. You show my mercy, man, I'm going to bless you with mercy. You sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh. You sow to the spirit, you reap of the spirit. Well, speaking of sowing to the flesh, check this out. He then says in verse 27, with the devious, Lord, you will show yourself shrewd. What does that mean? Well, the word devious and shrewd, they both come from the same root, to twist. To twist. Well, what's that mean then? Verse 27, with the devious, you show yourself shrewd. It means this. As James Boyce says, if a person insists on being devious, twisted in his ways against God, then God will outwit or twist that man as he deserves. I love that. God will twist him like a pretzel. Don't you love that? Listen, you, you're thinking, man, this person is twisting me, Lord. You twist him. Let him do the twisting. You don't have to. They cut you off on Florida Avenue. They got to twist him. I mean, not too bad. You, you got it, right? I mean, that sounded mean, but whatever. God says he'll do it for you. This whole section here is a reminder that God is faithful. We are sinners, but the sinner who trusts in Christ to be redeemed can know that their sins are washed and they're made, although they were scarlet, they are made white as snow. Listen, here's the deal. This is, this is so cliche-ish, but I'm going to say it anyways, all right? So I don't need to have your emails telling me how cliche it was. You heard it when you were in kindergarten. It's true. Where God puts a period, don't you put a question mark, right? I mean, we've all heard that. I told Jackie I was going to say this last night. She rolled her eyes. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I said, no, but it's true. It is true, right? We doubt. Do we not doubt? Has anybody in here ever doubted? Oh, come on. The rest of you haven't? Oh, how many of you are lying then? Let's raise that hand. <laughs> See, it's amazing. Two people raised their hand because I pointed that way. <laughs> doubt. I, I grew up with doubt. My name, my, my real whole first name is Thomas. So in Catholic school, I was just ridiculed. Doubting Thomas. Among other things, Tom Thumb, Tom Tom the Piper Son, but Do Doubting Thomas was, and, and, and we doubt, right? I go through my periods of doubt, and God says, listen, if you're saved, you're saved. Believe it. You don't have to question it. To all who receive him, he gives them the right to become children of God. You need mercy? God says, show yourself mercy. You'll find mercy back. It is a period. It's not a question mark. Somebody else needs a helping hand, you help them out. They need to pay their light bill, you help them out. So when you need help, God will make sure he takes it. It's a period. It's not a question mark. And you got somebody who's twisting you? you can just let God do the twisting. God will take care of it. He's the one who is faithful. Number four, David writes about the one who delivers. Lots of verses I'm going to read. You guys ready? Lots of reading. You guys ready? Okay. Verse 29.
For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. That's pretty awesome. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He sets me on high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again until they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked but there was none to save, even the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets. This is a man's portion of a song. And I spread them out. Verse 44. <laughs> Verse 44. For you have also delivered me from the strivings of my people, you have kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. Wow, I love this. David is, is, is accentuating in these verses, it is God who delivers. David say, man, I can't do it. I know me. I was that little kid that God used to defeat Goliath, but it was God who did, who did that. He delivered me from the hand of the paw, from, from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear and the paw of all my enemies and the paw of Saul. It is God who has given me victory. It is God who has given me strength. It is God who has given me a mind to be able to go into battle. It is God who has given me ability. It is God who has surrounded me with great men to be able to press forward. It is God who has blessed our, our, our country, our nation with great women. It is God who has done all all of these wonderful things. And this is what David recognizes. Verse 30, as far as God, his way is perfect. Verse 31, the Lord is a shield to all those who trust in him. David could see with light and stand in God's strength, but he still needed supernatural protection and supernatural power. This is these, uh, uh, um, Ephesians chapter 6. The whole armor of God, right? It's God's armor the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of, of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword, the feet, everything is covered. That's God's armor. Listen, you can't beat the devil. You cannot beat the enemy of your soul. He will beat you every time. But God is the one who will give you the victory. So you stand firm in God. You don't stand in your own strength. You're going to fall. You're going to get whooped in the spiritual battle. You're going to get distressed, you're going to be depressed, you're going to be a doubter, you're going to be a mess. But it is God. He is my protector. He is the one who guards the house. He is the one who guards my life. I can't tell you how often I pray this prayer over my family. Almost every night after they're all asleep. Psalm 127 verse 1 where God says, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. This is what I know. No matter if I have a dog, I have an alarm, I have a shotgun, and I, and I think I have karate. Listen, none of those things. <laughs> Unless God is guarding my house, it's going to be of no avail. I'm going to be sound asleep. The, the, the enemy is going to be able to come in. And I recognize, God, you've got to protect my family. You've got to protect my children. You've got to protect this church. You've got to protect our lives. God, we need you spiritually. We need you emotionally. We need you physically. Lord, we need you. Be my shield. Be my protector unless the Lord guards it, man. The, the watchman stays awake in vain. And then in, in verse 36, he says this very interesting thing. David says, your gentleness has made me great. He's talking about the greatness and awesomeness of God and his power and his strength and he's a fortress and he's a rock. 
Your gentleness has made me great. You know what I think this is? Again, a reminder of his sin. Again, back to Peter. Peter's sin. Lord, although everybody else denies you, I'm never going to deny you. Lord, I'm going to love you more than anybody else, right? We already covered that. Jesus raises from the grave. Jesus sees the women at the tomb, and he says, go tell Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter, right? Jesus started the restoration process with Peter right away. After Peter had sinned and denied the Lord three times, again, the difference between Judas and Peter, Peter repents, Judas did not. Peter denies the Lord three times. After he's busted in his denial, he goes out and he weeps bitterly. I cannot imagine what Peter must have been going through. Or I should say I can only imagine what Peter must have been going through. He denies the Lord. Who would do that? And I look at that, he denies the Lord, he's busted, the rooster crows, and the Bible tells us that he went out and he wept bitterly. Oh, have you ever wept bitterly? Oh, how I bet he wept bitterly. And I bet when he heard Jesus rose from the grave, he's thinking, oh no, now I've really got problems. (laughs) I mean, is that how we think? Is it? We think, this is how we think. That God in heaven, I, 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 Porky Pig, I'm in so much trouble right? That's how we think. I'm done. The heavy hand of God, of of the God of vengeance is going to step out of heaven and crush me and make me pay. But Jesus meets him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He's cooking breakfast for him, pulls him aside. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I'm not so sure. It's all right. You'll be all right. You're going to do great work for me. I'm convinced with David he's able to look back at his own sin and say, man, you're the one who restores me gently. Let this be a reminder for you and I when we see a brother or sister who's fallen into sin and they want to repent, right? They're saying, man, I just want to come back. I want to get it right. What are we supposed to do? Restore them in the spirit of gentleness, remembering our own weaknesses. Galatians chapter 6, right? The person says, man, will the church take me back? Will you love me? Will this happen? Will that happen? We restore them with gentleness because we have a gentle Savior. Lastly, number five, David remembers the one who saves. Man, you guys are going to be out on time today. (laughs) Woo! Woo! Verse 47, the Lord lives, look at that exclamation mark, blessed be my rock, let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation, it is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me, he delivers me from my enemies, you also lift me up above those who rise against me, you have delivered me from the violent man, therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name, verse 51, he is the tower of salvation to his king, he shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever more. Wow. We made it. 51 verses on a Sunday morning. I've never done that before, which means with me you've never done it before either. Verses 5 and 6, David said, the waves of death have surrounded me and confronted me. They've surrounded me and confronted me, and this is what we can know. Death has met its match in Jesus, our Savior. 1 Corinthians 15 You know it. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, Hades, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 28, he will save the humble. Verse 47, blessed be the rock, the Lord lives. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. Verse 51, he is the tower of salvation to his king. He shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. That would be you and I if you're in Christ. With that, I'll close with these words. I I, I love these words to this hymn. How great thou art. You know that old hymn? I'm not going to torture you. I'm not going to sing it, so don't worry about it. You think it's okay for me to sing it? You need extra prayer. (laughs) 
Just, well, you know, I'm just kidding. I didn't really mean that, that bad. I meant anybody who thinks I can sing is just nice. You're just kind. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. God is great, is he not?